All right, we'll go ahead and get started. I'll go ahead and share my screen and we'll kick it off. Hi everyone, welcome to our Marketo Engage Champion Office Hours for November of this year. We'll go ahead and jump right in and jump into introductions, some house rules, and then move on over to our questions for the session. So I'm Jasmine. I'm currently a marketing operations manager at Algolia. Um, I handle a lot of our campaign operations as well as our tools and handling them with our third party vendors and helping guide our stakeholders into what they want to target, who they want to target their um, campaigns to. And um, I'll kick it off to Joy. Um, go ahead and start us off with introductions. Hey everybody, I'm Joy Martinez, uh, Senior Director of Marketing Operations at CS2 Marketing. Um, work with um, a handful of clients, uh, mostly in like B2B SaaS space, um, working on um, advising uh, on strategy and execution um, within marketing ops, um, heavy emphasis on Marketo, and I'll pass it off to Evan. Hey y'all, uh, name is Evan Kubicek. I am a senior manager of marketing operations at Pendo, focused on platform operations. So I am in charge of making sure the connective tissue between all of our marketing platforms uh, syncs together nicely with platforms across RevOps, across CS Ops, but uh, usually in the background in the plumbing, um, and that's where I like to be. So I will popcorn it over to Max. Unmute. Um, hi, y'all. I'm Max. I'm a Senior Director of Marketing Operations and Analytics at Druva. Um, largely now kind of focus on, in addition to the core uh, operations automation, data management background um, and, and backbone of the company, focus on where we spend our money uh, in demand generation and digital and how to translate that into business value. So I will lob it on over to uh to jane now hi everyone um i'm jane i work at wix um i'm currently a product marketing manager um for the home page and so i'm responsible for the cro running different a b tests and uh, making sure we're bringing business to the company um i've recently switched to the more uh, strategic role and um before that i worked for five years in marketing automation operations i'm a big fan of marketo um got my certification in the beginning of this year and I'm curious about all the new technology and implementing this in the company. And I'll pass it over to Jasmine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'll move on over to our next slide here. And we have some upcoming education opportunities. And of course, since you're in this office hour, I'm assuming that most, if not all of us are in the mug chapter. However, if you are not, um, feel free to look at or click through this link and then you'll be able to join a certain mug chapter in your specific location um, and also if you're curious of other locations as well um, you could feel free to sign up for them as well and we also have updates to our marketo engage certifications we now have the adobe um, certified professional certification and the Adobe, Adobe Certified Expert. Again, these both have existed in the past, but some of the questions have been updated and changed. Um, for the expert exam, um, some questions have been designed by us, the Marketo Champions. So you'll get to, you'll be able to see um, the different uh, qualifications, questions that we have. And there are also um, guides online and links to if you would like to acquire this certification. And last but not least, Summit 2023 is live and scheduled to happen in March 21st to 23rd of next year, 2023. It'll be both in person and um, virtual as well. Registrations are available to sign up on the Adobe website. And we highly recommend you check it out and check out all of our sessions. And I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and we can jump into questions.
now being at the end of the year or upcoming end of the year, or if your quarter is coming up, I wanted to start off with some uh, best practices. So the first question that we have, I'll pass this over to Jane. Um, we have a submission asking, how do you keep your instance clean? Um, for example, twice a year, we do um, depletions of uh, dead leads. Are there any other suggestions that you may have? Yeah, uh, that's a great question because the thing that keeping your Mercado instance clean and your sales is clean is crucial, um, both for marketeers and for robots. Um, what I find important is to make sure that you use the same fields, the same buckets, especially if you're doing data enrichment, because um, if you're importing data from, um, let's say, Zooming for a clear bit, and they have a specific way to send data, um, we could use an example of um, the employee count and could be one to thousand and then like thousand and one to five thousand. So make sure that uh, your Mercado field has the same buckets. That can definitely help. And also um, when you do the initial saying that something you should be mindful of because Mercado has a person um, field and Salesforce uses lead and contact. So make sure that you're syncing your data correctly because uh, later on, if there is the same person under contact and under lead in Mercado, it will be viewed as two different objects. Um, and yeah, be mindful that Mercado does use email for deduplication. So if you want to use a different field for deduplication, think about this when you're doing the initial sync because that might really help you in the future. Um, maybe anyone wants to add something? I would add, also go yeah, ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, I mean, in terms of like keeping clean, um, you know, normalizing any data that you can normalize. Um, I was just doing it with a client earlier today um, and just making sure that everything, you know, will um, segment correctly, score correctly, sync and route correctly. Um, that normalization is, is a key piece as well. Yeah, I also agree with Joy in that normalization is very important. Um, I recently had to go through our current um, database and see any um, any dupes that were there, but also a lot of the more missing country state fields and a lot of essential fields that you would think would be uploaded or applied as they go in our database. So once you go through that data hygiene routine, it's important to look for those certain fields. Great, awesome. And I'll move on to the next question here. Um, this one, I'll pass it over to Max. Um, I have seen some questions submitted in which um, some people are asking, what are some recommended first steps when you inherit a new instance? Um, whether that be when you inherit an instance that's already formatted well, or perhaps maybe it was a total migration from a different platform to Marketo. Are there any recommendations that you have? Sure. Um, I think first of all, to level set, like I've, I've been at my current company for almost two years now. I am still finding things that previous marketing operations teams set up every single day uh, and i'm like why why is that the way that it is so you'll you'll never catch everything when you inherit an instance especially if it's had several owners historically like it's a little easier to inherit one that's only had one previous team um or start from scratch in my opinion but uh one of the things that i do i don't know if i'm allowed to share my screen um is that is that okay to share screen <laughs> Um, if I'll give it a shot. We'll see what happens. Sure. We'll see what happens. Um, <laughs> we go. So I have, um, uh, okay, it's it's not going to share my screen. That's fine. I have an audit, um, an audit template that I use. Um, I'm happy to share it uh, after, maybe as part of the follow-up email. Um, that basically goes through, I, I forget which vendor I stole this from like years and years ago, but I use this every time I inherit an instance. Um, yes, Robin, very excited about templates. So um, basically, I I go through all these line items. It's broken into different categories like marketing activities, you know, the, the components of your Marketo instance, uh, admin section, um, database section, design studio, et cetera. 
And it, it's not perfect, like it's not uber detailed, um, you know, in the nitty gritty of all the technical components, but, um, you know, it, it gives you a good starting point to determine the hotspots. And so um, like when I joined my company, the first thing I did was start to go through this checklist and it took a couple weeks. Like it's, it's, you know, it's a lot to inherit. So it's not, not something you can do in a day. Um, and then that helped me identify kind of my top few priorities when I inherited the instance, like, oh my God, the, 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 the structure of this is just out of whack. Like there's no way we can operate efficiently in the system. So we have to focus on full structure naming conventions before we go and focus on users or something like that. Um, and then when I had a, a team member join a year later as a senior manager, I had her also go through that audit template and see if she saw, you know, the same hotspots that I did when I joined or some of those had gotten results. So, um, you know, I find this template really helpful. Uh, I'll share it, but that's kind of my starting point when I inherit an instance, just in terms of prioritizing quick wins, long-term projects, et cetera. Awesome. Anyone else want to add to that on the panel? Yeah, I'll second, um, you know, there, there are lots of audit templates out there. I know there are some champion blogs um, that also have audit templates. Um, I can't recall exactly which ones, but they're definitely there. Um, and then I would also emphasize when you're inheriting something, uh, anytime I inherit an instance, I like to put kind of a moratorium on any changes for the first, um, you know, two to three months so you can understand all the plumbing. Because to Max's point, there are lots of interconnected foundational systems in there that someone set up and it made sense in their mind, but it might not make sense to you. But uh, understanding what's there at a deep level, I think, is critical before making major changes. So if you do inherit an instance, use an audit, get to a baseline, and then gather requirements before messing with the plumbing. Um, because if you don't know what you're doing and you don't have a clear plan, you can create more of a problem than what you already had on your hands. Yeah, definitely. Thank you both for sharing. I'll hop on to the next question that we have here. Um, this one I'll pass on to Joy. Um, are there any uh, best practices for lead scoring in 2022 or any current updates compared to previous years? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, I mean, there's probably, we could probably do an entire session on lead scoring and there's a lot of different ways to um, slice and dice that depending on um, your business model and your goals and things like that. So, but high level, um, I'll talk a little bit about um, just some, some things to consider strategy wise before you actually start your build and then also highlight some, some key things um, in the actual build in Marketo. So, um, I mean, I think most of us know that like behavior score plus demographic score equals the person score and the person score is one of the out of the box system fields with Marketo. Um, so I think setting up those two um, custom fields of behavior score and demographic score are definitely helpful to make up those um, components um, so that you can really see where they're leaning in behavior and where they're leaning in demographically um, or I, more so where you're leaning in demographically as a company. Um, and then I love a good like uh, lead matrix, like lead grading model when it comes to scoring. Um, so instead of just triggering off of behaviors um, and demographic changes and, and profiles, um, looking at both the fit in like a ABCD grade and their behavior one, two, three, four, and pairing those together um, and kind of putting them into um, a matrix is really helpful um, for a few reasons. Um, you can really kind of see um, conversion rates specifically on certain grades of MQLs versus looking at all your MQLs as a whole and really pinpoint, um, you know, if you are scoring, uh, assigning the right score to um, certain behaviors and to certain demographic attributes, um, you can, uh, I guess, um, just better troubleshoot and pinpoint like levers that you can pull within your scoring to be able to get better conversion rates and things like that. Um, when you're actually um, preparing to set up, um, you can even put them into like an MQL simulator if you want. Like there's a lot of templates out there um, to kind of simulate different scenarios. Like if I had 
done three different behaviors and I had these demographic attributes, like would that actually put me up over my MQL threshold or not? Um, so you can kind of do that to prepare ahead of time and just make sure that your scores are sound. And then when it comes to actually um, building, um, I like utilizing my tokens in the program. Um, it makes it very easy to swap out and make changes. So as you get feedback from sales or you're seeing different trends in your conversion rates or um, things like that, you want to adjust your scores over time. Scoring is always iterative. So um, being able to have like one place in the my tokens where you can go to update those scores it makes it really easy than going to all the individual campaigns um and then i um ideally um and sometimes you have to have a little bit of foundation in place to do this i love to actually use executable campaigns within scoring um and kind of include it as a core process in uh like how you would want to process things when they enter your database um so you might have in your order of operations like uh, normalization and lead sourcing and lead scoring would be part of it. And then your lead life cycle after scoring and then your sync to Salesforce um, after that point. And that could all be controlled with executable campaigns. And so I know a lot of people have heard of executable campaigns, maybe haven't gotten their hands in executable campaigns, but there's a million different use cases for it in Marketo and um, scoring is just one of them. Um, it makes it very easy to ensure that um, you are uh, not missing people to be scored and also um, just allow it to um, even assist with like how fast somebody would process through um, the campaign queue and things like that. Um, one other thing I would account for is like lead merges. Like if you want to reset your demographic score after lead merging, have a smart campaign listening for that lead merge where you can then reset your demographics and reset your person score um, to equal your behavioral score. Um, that's helpful. And then the one last tip that I'll add in, um, and then anybody else can chime in, is your schedule tab of all your smart campaigns is an area that I think a lot of people forget and miss. So making sure that um, your schedule tab is not ever set to just only once unless you truly only want to score that person just once ever. <laughs> it should either be every time or once every four hours or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and so ensuring that you're changing and updating that schedule tab and allowing people to flow through as many times as you want them to qualify and be able to get scored upon is important. Anything else anybody wants to uh, add on as well? Again, it's kind of a hard topic to squeeze in like real short, but those are just some some high level tips. Um, I just wanted to add that um, this year we um, we started um, doing marketing automation for one of the Wix's products, which was quite new in the market and it was a B2B be product. So um, instead of using the subscription based system that Wix is using, we were more of like B2B um, product within Wix. And we actually built the um, scoring model around our ICP, the ideal customer profile. So let's say if your company is going after a specific country, a specific industry, or um, specific fun person doing specific or specific function and specific job level, then I really recommend building your scoring around that. So to concentrate more on the demographic rather than behavioral scoring, especially if you if you're going to market with a new product, so you don't know um, yet if um, you know except for uh, someone requesting a demo, if someone is more in the MQL um, level or not, and then you can also maintain your database cleaner because instead of using uh, different titles, which could be anything, and we don't know that even like in the marketing ops field, the same job can um, have different title in different companies. And then especially when you're running campaigns on um, different ad platforms, such as LinkedIn, um, and you're getting in like all the people that seem to be relevant, but then are not, um, you can create um, com marketing campaigns in um, Marketo, um, which would put people having similar job titles, uh, let's say if, you, if you're after human resource, and that could be HR, human resource, human resources, um, all of them would be under the job function HR. And um, you can also create a campaign which would put people into job level bu buckets. Let's say if you're going after executives, then you want to target someone who has the title as a CEO, CFO, CMO, officer, owner, president. And that really helps you to maintain the data clean and to target the right people. That's all I want to add. Um, I'll also add two points. Um, I think 
Jane's call out of, of demographic scores are uh, extremely important mapping that to your ICP. Additionally, one thing that we've run into um, is we we have a lot of enrichment that happens manually because we're working with very small companies. So vendors like Zoom Info and others don't tend to uh, have information for these folks. And because of that manual enrichment, their demographic score can pop much later than when a behavioral action may have taken place. So one thing that we do is before passing an MQL, we make sure that there has been a behavioral update within the past 24 hours. So even if their demographic score pops in which they would usually qualify as an MQL, we don't want to pass someone who hasn't taken any sort of behavioral action in a long time. And it saved us a lot of headache in terms of sales outreach where people are like, hey, I, you know, I consumed your content three months ago. Why am I hearing from you today? So it introduces an element of recency that's been very helpful for us. And then um, I think one other aspect that's been really valuable is we there's been mention of feedback from your sales team to update your model. One thing that we did when we were having sales folks disqualify MQLs for whatever reason, we added a dependent field in Salesforce that required them to offer feedback on why they were disqualified. And so we can report against those disqualification reasons and update our score in a programmatic way. So it's not just gathering feedback, sort of anecdotal evidence, but we build it into our process of disqualification. And that's been really powerful for us as well. I, I We all have a lot to say about scoring. Clearly, we all love this topic. Um, totally aligned to what Evan just said that like sales feedback, while you should always be skeptical, like as a marketer, you should kind of sign like an agreement to understand that you are supporting the sales team. You're not scoring for the sake of driving the highest volume of MQLs you possibly can. Like I'm sure a lot of marketing ops people may be part of like a demand gen org. Be super skeptical of what your demand gen stakeholders are asking you to do with scoring. Um, just as much, if not more, than what your sellers are telling you in terms of feedback about scoring. And, you know, please look past the MQL threshold um, for performance. Uh, yes, Chris. Um, and, like, look at the conversion rates past that. Like, you know, sales is going to really want to give you anecdotal feedback. And depending on how you set up these feedback fields, you know, we, we have, like, you know, essentially nurture, recycle, plus DQ. And there's always a reason that they have to select, but you just, you can also never know whether they're just picking the first option on the list or not. Um, so you should always have a, a manual feedback cycle with them on a recurring basis to, to validate that um, verbally. But look further, like look, what's the next stage of your funnel? Is it an SQL or an SAL? Is some is a particular channel or type of campaign converting or not converting? And then you can again work back to is that because our scoring is wrong, which we have found over and over again to be the case where we're overscoring. Um, people are not really sales ready, which is the whole point. Um, or is sales not following up accurately, which is the other thing that we find where they're not using any of the actual data that we're giving them as part of that MQL, and they're just being super generic with their messaging and defeating the whole purpose of the money we spend to get this intent information or this project information that we need. So um, be super skeptical, but also remember that you are there to support the sales team, not your demand gen team. You're there to like support the business motion. Yeah, definitely all valid points, especially with um, notifying or just making sure that the sales team knows that you're partnering partnering with them rather than working against them because i also have run into some conversations of you know why aren't we getting so many mqls or people pass on to us like is there something against against us or something like that but again the clear communication is always key great excellent topic that we all love but we will move on to a different topic here um, and I will route this question to Jane. So we have a submission and they had asked, um, there is an acquisition approaching for their company, I'm assuming, and we will have multiple Salesforce instances. Should we have multiple Marketo instances? And if so, would we lose um, Sync and MSI? And that's the, that's the basis of their question. <laughs> right. 
So Mercado and Salesforce integrations always work as one-to-one, -one, meaning you can only sync one Mercado instance to one Salesforce instance. So that's something that you should be mindful of. And then really it depends on the business model. If uh, like, like Wix, oh, we had completely different products selling to completely different customers using different um, marketing and sales model, then yeah, we didn't want to have um, everyone in one Mercado instance. But if it's just separate business units and you're okay to have one database, and essentially you're going to send uh, leads to, to sales in a similar manner, then I would use just one Mercado instance. Um, and there's multiple uh, tutorials on how you can do either or. So I, I would recommend like really uh, first identifying what is, uh, what is your user journey for each of those um, uh, businesses. And if it's different, then definitely go for, for separate uh, instances and then sync each separate one to its uh, Salesforce instance. And that would, that's something that we did at Wix and that's been working um, fairly well for us. Anyone wants to add something? I'll just add in too, like even if you are using within the one instance, you could still utilize like workspace and partitions for if you do want to partition off your database a little bit. Um, you know, um, I have seen like B2C and B2B databases all in one Marketo instance um, and, and still work. Obviously workspaces and partitions do add a layer of complexity, but they definitely can be the right solution for the right use case um, and, and, and company using it. So um, do keep in mind that you can, you know, um, have different business units using different workspaces. You can uh, definitely partition off that database if you need to keep them separate for various reasons um, and still be connected to just the single Salesforce instance as well. Great, thank you both. If um, there are any other comments on that, I'll move on to the next question that we have. And this is a question for um, our broad panelists here. Um, the question is, um, using engagement programs after MQL stage to becoming a sale, are there any opportunities to use engagement programs in that instance? I would, um, <clears throat> this has come up a couple times for us in, in a couple different contexts actually. So one is post MQL or maybe post pipeline engagement and how we approach that. The other is post customer, like what, you know, like as a customer nurture or customer life cycle. But I think this person's asking about still like a prospect first time conversation, potentially. Um, there will be a theme in my feedback, I think, which is like talk to your salespeople first. Um, if, if you're in a B2B company where it's a sales led motion and you're not working with like a product led growth motion where you're feeding into a technology as opposed to a person, you're feeding into a technology. It's a lot easier to kind of justify, um, like if your product is leading your sale, um, a lot easier to justify like overlapping touches like that in a digital versus like, you know, emails digital, but email versus like product led communication setting. But if it's a if it's salespeople, they're very sensitive to how you're engaging with the people that they're supposed to proactively be talking to. So I think there is room to do that. Um, but as we know, with email communication for marketing, you really don't want to oversaturate. People get really tired of spamming. They they know that you're a salesperson from your company, and so is your marketing email. So they see a bunch of emails coming from your company. What we have decided to do is is not necessarily the right move for everyone but we have agreed to go hands off for a, for a certain part of that conversation between mql and opportunity creation we go hands off where we say sales that's all you once it hits opportunity in those early stages is where we see the most difficulty with pipeline progression once it hits later mid later stages there's a much higher likelihood it's going to close sales is paying much more attention but in those early stages we turn back on our communication and it's a it's a limited level of communication and a different type of communication where more balance between like physical mailers and e-gifts, um, you know, higher cost, but maybe more likelihood to engage with this smaller audience. 
than just like all email all the time. So determine the best fit for the way that your sales team is working or maybe where you see a pain point like for us is early stage pipeline movement, not necessarily like between MQL and opportunity. So chat with your sales team. It's not it's not going to necessarily be exactly the same as your prospect nurture approach. Yeah. I'll add to what Max said too, because um, I have done it successfully um, once before, but it's so it's so nuanced to what Max was saying. Like, with um, definitely you need your sales involved. Um, the way that we did it is uh, like a stage zero to stage two nurture. So it was um, uh, the opportunity had been opened. Um, stage one and two being active pipeline, so it was part of the active pipeline as well. But then once you hit a certain stage, like it wouldn't continue. Um, but the elements that we used in Marketo to like actually facilitate that is they were very just like text-based emails. We wanted them to actually come uh, come from like the from sender name um, and address and signatures from the opportunity owner, uh, which typically um, you could easily send it from like the account owner, but that in our case, it may not have been the same person as the opportunity owner. So we actually populated a custom field for opportunity owner um, and used snippets to um, dynamically change in whoever that opportunity owner was for the from and the signature lines. Um, they were very personalized. And then if a sales rep um, did not want them to be in that nurture, they actually use Sales Insight in Salesforce and used the like request or add to can Salesforce not Salesforce add to campaign functionality within Sales Insight, and that triggered the removal of it in Marketo. So they all knew and had agreed on that anybody that was tied to a stage zero to two opportunity would be included but if they wanted to exclude people they would request that campaign on those particular contact records and it would trigger them to be removed from the flow um so just some kind of mechanics behind the scenes that um <laughs> helped us accomplish that um but it's, it's very nuanced i agree Yeah, Just the Salesforce to... component is something new that I've only used once or twice or so. And I think because um, since the first time I used it, like you said, Joy, it would remove someone from the Marketo campaign. That kind of caused like a panic, at least in my team of like, why did this person suddenly disappear? Like as if they were fully removed, but totally get that. That was um, associated more so with the Salesforce and the, the sales folks and what they're planning to do. And Jane, did you want to add something as well? I cut you off a little bit there. No, no, no worries. Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, and we also ran a specific nurture campaigns um, for opportunities um, and like at later stages, especially when um, it took up uh, longer than usual to, to close the sale. And we kind of wanted to provide um, our potential clients with uh, specific data, specific information. And it was all intent based, um, based on like how they interacted with us. Um, and uh, we did also use the snippets to, to send the signals from the right people. And um, honestly, that's something that we've implemented in the recent months. And that was a request coming from sales. And it's something that did help us to, to increase our pipeline and to get more deals closed. So that's definitely something I, I would recommend considering. Awesome, thank you all. I'll move on to our next question here. Um, this one I will pass to Evan. Someone had asked, are there any recommendations on how to build a best strategy to lead life cycle that matches your buyer's journey and what to consider? Yeah, um, so this is gonna be one of those questions I think that uh, the whole panel will have opinions on. It's a pretty broad question, um, but I think when you're talking about something as important as lead life cycle and a buyer's journey, um, the first piece of advice, I'm gonna step back from Marketo and say, you need ironclad requirements um from your stakeholders in order to understand the buyer's journey so across sales and marketing is there very clear alignment on what your buyer's journey entails is that documented somewhere so that you have something to operate from uh building a buyer's journey in a vacuum is um 
is a very dangerous game to play. I've had to do it in the past. So I recommend that you have very good requirements up front before you even touch any of your systems. Um, and then once you have agreement and buy-in from both sales and marketing around what that entails, you can start to map it to a life cycle. So uh, we've talked a little bit about it already, but you know, MQL, SAL, SQO, opportunity, close one, close boss, remarket, those are kind of some of the standard lead lifecycle statuses that you will see. Um, I think it totally depends on your individual instance if you need additional stages. Um, we also operate not just on account stages, but contact stages, uh, contact statuses in our business. So we want to see things that allow us to do funnel level reporting and um, velocity reporting around whether or not once they were MQL, when was the meeting booked with an SDR? When did the demo take place with the rep? So those types of things allow you to get really granular on where you can try to push acceleration in the buyer's journey. So I think you want to think about very granularly how you capture each stage of that buyer's journey, what the actions inside each of those stages entail and where you can capture those in a way that allows you to measure them and report against them because that's extremely valuable information. Once you can unlock velocity level reporting, your forecasting is going to go, the level of complexity that you can deliver in your forecasting goes through the roof. Um, so I'm, I think those are the most important pieces. Um, but when you're talking about the systems themselves, I would recommend going first with kind of a standard implementation. There's great documentation from um, Marketo and Adobe about what lead lifecycle looks like. That's a great starting point. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. I think you can start with that for a 1.0, those basic stages I described. And then as you learn more through your reporting, your velocity reporting, your funnel reporting, then you can start to make changes. But I think it's a, it's a never ending process, much like lead scoring. There are always going to be iterations that you're making, but start with the industry standard. Uh, that's one that I think everyone understands. And then from there, you can start to make improvements and changes that are specific to your business and ICP. And I'm sure the rest of the panel has thoughts and they can chime in here too. Make sure your stakeholders, whether this is like ops driven to define this, usually it's usually it's not. It's a good opportunity to to lead something meaningful. Um, but make sure that whoever the stakeholders are also understand like lead life cycle is not necessarily the same as your customer life cycle. Um, and that you are just mapping one part of that journey potentially I, i've always seen those two things separated um like you know lead through initial close one and then completely separate customer life cycle because it's a totally different group of people with different needs and other teams involved in talking to them in a specific way um it's I, I I totally agree with Evan on on not reinventing the wheel. Like it's uh, same could be said for a, a lot of other operational work that we do. Like there's so many smart people that have worked on this. Like start with the template and see if there's anything nuanced that you need to apply to your business. Um, and you know operationally, Marketo as well. Like the way you you know the way you automate stages of your lead life cycle is probably going to be separate from the way you communicate with those stages in your cycle. Like you could have, you know, nurture engagement programs set up that are separate from like the way you're automating stages. And that was what I was going to say. The, the other thing is if you're using, you know, if you're working with leads versus contacts in Salesforce where, you know, it's not everything starts as a contact or something like that. Um, one of the things I've run into is lead versus contact statuses. It's all, the lead life cycle like your your lead life cycle from our standpoint is a person life cycle for prospects it's more of like a prospect life cycle but the way that sales is looking at leads versus contacts they may be changing certain statuses or certain fields on one object versus another and like one of the things we found early on was for some reason there was a completely different contact status that was syncing to a custom contact status field that was not our person status field and if we hadn't like caught that 
uh, none of our contacts would have fed correctly into our lead life cycle. So investigating the way that your objects work in Salesforce or in whatever CRM you're using um, and making sure that the way that sales updates and changes those will work with your lead life cycle automation in Echo. Yeah, I'll just add in too, like also think of the reporting up front, like how, how are you going to want to report on it and what are you going to want to report um, may dictate even like what fields you would want to create ahead of time that are being stamped throughout your life cycle um, and things like that. Um, even like when somebody meets a certain stage and you have a checkbox that gets checked, you're able to simply, you know, add like, oh, met marketing qualified as a summary formula inside a Salesforce report very easily and be able to like look at conversion rates from one stage to another stage really easy through that checkbox. Um, you know, just kind of thinking through um, those elements up front so that when you are actually for even set up fields and build, you kind of got your worksheet, your workbook that you're, you've got all your existing fields, make sure they're all mapped correctly. Like Max was just talking about like on person statuses and such, and that you have thought through like what you actually want to create. Um, and also if you're using tools like outreach or um, sales loft or something like that, how those tools also play into the life cycle is helpful as well. Um, I'll kind of go back to like, if you don't have a life cycle at all right now, keep it simple, like V1, like Evan said. But if you do, um, if you've had a life cycle and it just needs some optimization or some rework and you are us utilizing those types of um, sales engagement tools, then um, keep that in mind as well. Because oftentimes sales reps are changing um, outreach statuses and stages and things like that inside of those platforms. Um, and they may affect um, some of the same fields that you're setting in your life cycle. So you just got to think of those things together up front. I just want to add on uh, to what Joy was saying that um, you should think about this uh, in the early stages to understand how you want to sync leads back to Salesforce. And um, sometimes, you know, you can ask your salespeople and they will tell you, we don't want to see any leads that are not um, sales qualified in Salesforce. And then um, all the back end processes of uh, lead qualification scoring uh, may run in Marketo and you can decide that like once that field is checked, that the lead is qualified to pass to Salesforce, only then the thing could happen. That's something where, that we did in the past and uh, that, that really helped us to keep the data clean in both system. And we kept uh, Marketo more for um, marketing automation of uh, leads that did not reach uh, the qualification and Salesforce for those that did and uh, then further communication with salespeople happened there. Great, thank you all for sharing. Yeah, I would agree that um, the same processes would be applied there. Um, I'll move on to our next question here. Um, again, more of a broad question for our panel. Um, are there any best use cases or recommendations for dashboards for email insights? And again, fairly broad question. Um, uh, if they're if this if the person asking the question is specific like they, when they say email insights with capital e capital i they mean the module in marketo uh, correct yes i don't i i personally don't find that module all that helpful um what i will occasionally use it for is for like large swath reporting over time just to show like high level changes in you know, um, open rates, click to opens rates, unsubscribe rates. But in terms of like actionable reporting, I, I find just as much of a more value in just the basic email uh, performance reports or email link performance reports. The, the only thing I, and again, you can do the same thing with email performance reports, so it's not a differentiator really. But um, there is also some like, segmentation filtering that you can apply in the email insights module um you know if you click from it starts with like this personal view where you select like batch versus trigger um you can click into like the system view where you can add these dimensions for your segmentations and email insights um you can you can do a little bit of like additional segmentation work but again you can do the same thing for your email performance just basic reports so 
it looks a little better if you're trying to grab a screenshot of like, uh, you know, clicks and opens rates and things like that and subscribes. But um, I personally don't find it that helpful. I would be super interested mm -hmm. to hear if other folks are using it, <laughs> you know, more. Yeah. I'm kind of in the same vein. Um, I know, I think too, like even after a send, it takes like 24 hours or something to like fully show up and populate in there. So I, I would lean more towards like, if you're looking at like initial quick results of things, like you're not even going to see it in there. So I use it more as like a, a trend comparison, like for a longer over time type things. Um, the one thing that I do find that's very helpful in there that you can't get out of like an email performance report would be um, like a browser like uh, versus mobile like comparison and things like that. Like if let's say you know that you have an email template that's not like very responsive or you know it might have some issues, but like you end up finding that most of your readership is on mobile, like from your email insights or something like it could trigger, you know, um, needing to needing a better email template or something like that. So, I mean, sometimes for like long term trend analysis type stuff or like you said, the segmentation stuff, but um, I find myself uh, more so utilizing the email performance reports and things like that. Yeah, I agree as well. The only time I've actually used email insights is when I'm creating a slide deck for, um, like Joy said, um, showing trends. And it's very, it's definitely more visually appe appealing than our regular Marketo reports. So whenever I do want something um, more visual and like a graphical kind of sense, I would just take a screenshot of whatever report I'm pulling and then apply that. But I'm on the same boat where I just use the regular um, built-in email reports and link reports in Marketo already. Yeah, I, I will jump on the same train and say, um, you know, a bit of a high horse, but I, I do think that these tend to be um, report requests that you get, but they are a little bit of a, a vanity metric because they don't really give you a sense of the impact of the emails that you're sending. So we gather these on a quarterly basis to Max's point to, um, to show trends around our database and how we're marketing to them. But outside of that, we tend to want to deliver reporting on the downstream impact of the emails. And that's usually something that's going to come out of Salesforce and contribution to pipe. So, uh, you know, I agree that the, it's, it's a more visual um, report that you can use for a slide deck, but we, we don't tend to use it heavily either. Yep. Agreed. And for our last couple minutes in our office hour, I'm going to move on to some questions that are more industry and career related. Um, so first question is, what are some of the few core skills someone new to marketing operations should have, whether it be soft skills, technical skills? I'll open this up to our panel. This is a loaded question as well, but um, I'll add in like uh, I always say curiosity, like number one um, is an awesome soft skill to have. Um, you know, I feel like curiosity allows you to like a like do good discovery work and understand current situations so that you can actually strategically um, you know, plan correctly, but then also it helps gain alignment between teams. So the more that you ask questions and are curious about their processes and their goals and things like that as well. So if you're working with sales ops or maybe you're part of a rev, rev op team still, but you're you're generally always working with other departments. And so it does help kind of uh, uh, improve that alignment if you can just have that curiosity. Um, and I think also like project management skills, I feel like us operation folks are also pretty good project management folks um, where we've got a lot going on at one time and um, are juggling a lot of different things and prioritizing tasks and, and taking incoming requests and things like that. So just leveling up on project management as a whole is something um, that I feel like is, is pretty big. Um, and I'll let other people chime in as well, but I could probably go on for days on this. <laughs> I, um, I'll add one thing that I think um, will serve anyone well in their career is uh, in, the, in your day to day, it's very hard to remember to create documentation um, around what you've done, what you've built. And once you're 
changing jobs or transitioning roles and you're taken away from the instance, you're going to forget everything that you did uh, inside that instance. So one thing that I really make an effort to do is to create a personal set of playbooks of builds that I've done. You can do it with Loom. You can do it um, in G Drive, like a personal G Drive, but document what you have done and categorize it in a way that you can use it as playbooks for future roles or um, future consulting gigs. It's really, really valuable to remember what you've done. Um, and those playbooks will serve you really well in interviews. If they ask you about how you might solve a problem, you can have a direct reference that you can walk them through and how you solved it, which I think is super valuable. There's not really a the equivalent of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, a design portfolio, but having something like that that you can reference is extremely powerful in an interview process. So I love to do that on like a bi-weekly or monthly cadence. If I've done something new or learned something new, I document it and then I put it in kind of a, a Notion database for myself, but you can put it in whatever organizational structure you prefer. But that's been a huge boon for my career in remembering all the stuff that I've done in other roles. Um, what I find, what I what I look for in a marketing ops person when I'm hiring, especially a junior person, um, I I really don't love when people have to be told what to do all the time. Like, and I don't mean like here's here's the ticket you have to execute because that's often where we start. That's that's being told what to do. But like you know, I see this all the time where we are asked to build an email. We build that email and we don't take the extra five seconds to look at that email as like a just a human and see like, oh, the spacing here looks weird. Just fix it. Like if, if someone has to be told literally every single minute little adjustment to make in everything, that's a huge problem for a manager and stakeholder. It's going to create a bunch of back and forth that's shouldn't be necessary. Yes, you want the stakeholder to give you everything specifically, but they're never going to do that. So folks who can look a little bit past just the flat out request and, and understand, like, understand some of that nuance without being asked every single time um, is something that that I look for in a, in a new team member. Right. Um, I would say that uh, problem solving skills are really important. Because more often than not, you're going to run into things that you've never encountered before. And you'll need to analyze research data. So, yeah, perseverance, uh, great analytical skills is uh, key. Um, technical skills that are important, in my opinion, knowing how to code at least basic HTML, CSS, um, SQL knowledge will help you even uh, with understanding the structure of the code. Um, a lot of people ask how to add uh, emojis to emails. And there is a great tool that um, Sanford Whiteman created and shared in the forums. But um, I ran in, into some problems with adding those, and then they would work on um, one email and not on the other, and one provider not on the other. And I had to troubleshoot it multiple times. And then um, if you look at the Unicode, you, you understand it's the same structure as, um, as HTML, and uh, you just need to apply uh, parameters when you like open the brackets and close the brackets, even if it's different symbols. So that's definitely something that helped me in my career, and uh, I think it's it's crucial for the marketing ops job. Some things that I look for also in more junior members as I'm taking them on in my team is um, also looking to see if they can look beyond the if they can look at the bigger picture. Like as Max said, if there's a small issue or problem that they know how to automatically fix whether whether it be a small spacing or perhaps maybe they notice there's a grammatical error in the content instead of just leaving it there and saying you know oh they didn't tell me to do that um, i would look for someone who's proactively looking for those small mistakes as well um, i also look for someone who is able to um, I guess the word would be who is scrappy as in like if i give them um, an assignment or i request like the emoji subject line as Jane said. So they, I wouldn't give them the exact, you know, tool or website right up front, but I'd rather just have them explore on their own and then see if they're able to 
dig up the solution. And of course, if they need any help, they would refer, refer to me, but only when absolutely necessary. Um, and that's what I look for. Just to give a very specific example, by the way, um, Jasmine was part of my team at one point. When we hired Jasmine in the interview process, like it's it was it was a small thing, I think, from your point of view, Jasmine. But as the hiring manager, you pointed out an issue with one of our like product led promotions at the time in the interview process, like right at the end, you were just walking out and you're like, oh, I don't know if you guys noticed, but like this communication looks wonky. You should work on it. Like that's the kind of thing where it's like, it, it, we didn't ask you to do that. You just did it. And it really like compared to anyone else that was in that process, like no one else even noticed. So that, that's the kind of thing that can stick with a hiring manager, especially early on. Yeah, I remember that. I literally had a screenshot of it on my phone. And right when Max is walking me out the door, I said, hey, there's no call to action button. So uh, you guys need to fix that. <laughs> that was that's a good memory. Thanks for bringing that up, Max. <laughs> Awesome. Well, it looks like we're at the end of our hour. Thank you all for attending. We will be sending out this recording as well as um, the slides and resources as well. Um, feel free to contact, contact us with any questions via LinkedIn, of course, respectively. And we will see you all at the next office hour. Thank you very much.